bit of a slide, if you will, coming off a lengthy losing streak by LSU standards, while Mississippi State has stepped it up a notch over the last couple of weeks. And for LSU, really the key is that Skip Bourbon has built a championship factory. Four national championships in the 90s, six SEC regular season championships, but this tournament has eluded Skip Bourbon and the LSU Tigers since 1994. So these gentlemen would like to come in here and make a statement and win the SEC tournament championship. Heaven knows they won a lot more of those outside of the tournament, though, of late. Yeah, there's no question Skip Bertman's main goal, and I think the team's main goal certainly is a national championship to try to three-peat. But this is important for his players, too, to come in here and play well. But Mississippi State had to really scrap down the stretch to get in here. Everybody was fighting for spots five, six, seven, and eight. They were one of the teams that uh, fought their way into this tournament. Absolutely, and this is a team that really nobody wants to play. Pat McMahon's group has a lot of character. Two-thirds of the way through the season, this team was 6-12 and 12 in SEC play. They went 1-2 and two in, a, in a weekend series against Kentucky, but that character has shown through. They went 8-3 and three to finish out the season in SEC play, and they fought their way in. They had to win on the last weekend of the season and win big just to qualify here. So it's a team, really, that nobody wants to play. They lost 2-3 or three against Kentucky about the midway point of the SEC season. Right. Since then, they have turned it up a notch, and they are playing good baseball. They win on day one. They lose yesterday, however. They will try to get things righted today against LSU, a tough opponent. We are just moments away from first pitch of our doubleheader as we come to you from Hoover Metropolitan Stadium. Stay with us. First pitch is next. up against a, a wall because they will come out and play extremely hard. Let's take a look at our lineups, and here's how the Tigers will do battle offensively. Danny Higgins hitting 305 will lead things off and play left field. Josh Dalton will be your shortstop at 300. Trey McClure, your second baseman, hitting third in the cleanup spot. Mr. Furness, Eddie Furness at 399 and 24 home runs. Brad Cressy's behind the plate. He's hitting 318, and he only has 22 long balls. Clint Earnhardt, your designated hitter. Blair Barbier is over at third base at 242. Cedric Harris out in center field and Jeremy Witten is in right field and hitting ninth. Taking a look at the Mississippi State Bulldog defense. Rusty Toms, Brooke Bryan, Brooks Bryan go and Brian Weiss go around the outfield. Travis Chapman, Brad Freeman, Chris Lauterhaus and Richard Lee are on the infield. Barry Patton is behind home plate and you heard the man just a moment ago. Chris Reineke is on the mound. The right-hander, he has been the Sunday starter for this team. Uh, talk about conference weekend, Friday, Saturday this is the gentleman that has pitched on Sunday. There you see the numbers, the key. He gives up an awful lot of base hits, 81 hits in just under 60 innings. 59 strikeouts in those 58 and two-thirds innings pitch. But one thing Chris Reineke is, is a professional prospect. A fastball that reaches close to 90 miles an hour. Very, very good off-speed pitch. He'll throw a slider and a curveball. The key, though, as Dave mentioned, you can't back these guys into a corner, and you have to get ahead of this LSU lineup. Really, nobody is uh, more timely hitting than this uh, offensive explosive lineup right there. Skip's crew, they hit when they have to. Lowest average in the conference, but the key is probably the most timely hitting team in the conference. There are some numbers on Mr. Burtman now in his 15th year as the leader of this Tiger baseball team. And, of course, they are looking to three-peat as NCAA champions. Their first task is to come out of the loser's bracket and pick up an SEC tournament champion. And we are underway. First pitch swinging a strike to Danny Higgins. The numbers on Higgins are pretty impressive. 305, 10 long balls and 27 RBIs. He does have 12 doubles to his credit. Mississippi State comes in here after winning on day one, losing last night. Now relegated here to the loser's bracket. LSU lost on day one. So they were battling for their lives yesterday, but came out with a victory. So the loser goes home in this game. The 0-2. Swing and a miss. Or excuse me, uh, scoreboard's all out of whack out there. Two and two now. I got it figured out. They've adjusted the, they've already adjusted things on me. They can't be doing that to me. I told them. Absolutely not. Foul back, still two and two. Two pitches ago uh, to Higgins, we saw the good change of Chris Reineke throws. He's going to have to get it over because it sets up his fastball close to 90, but it makes it look more like a 93, 94 mile an hour fastball if he gets that change up over. 
think he's 59 strikeouts to 20 walks. Make that 60 strikeouts to 20 walks. And Higgins goes down for out number one. And if you wonder why professional scouts like Chris Reinecke, well, it's because he lights up the radar gun, but it's because of a changeup like that. Look at how far out on the front foot just pulled the string big time. That's a big league changeup. You don't see many that good at this level. And the shortstop, Josh Dalton, will step in. He's in at even 300. Fastball downstairs, maybe a little bit inside. This LSU team not hitting the ball very well. That has been their Achilles heel all year. They still hit the long ball. That's in there for a strike. But for the most part, this team has been struggling with a stick at 293, lowest in the Southeastern Conference. And in this SEC tournament, they are hitting under 250. strike one and two and look at the location on those pitches down and away down and away we saw Josh Falk of the University of Florida last night pitch against University Auburn University I should say and got a couple of pitches not down and away belt height down the middle off speed stuff this guy's not doing that well I would say that Mr. Reineke is fooling the Tigers here early on back to back strikeouts you throw your fastball away, then the curveball comes in, and it looks so big coming up. It looks so easy to hit, and boy, when it drops right there. A late-breaking pitch. Josh Dalton's been red hot of late, but that will cool him off. If you can get a curveball over to the left-handed hitter, then you're even more doubly dangerous. Now the task is Trey McClure. And it's safe to have nobody on when Mr. McClure steps <laughs> up with 72 RBIs and 23 long balls. Fouled straight back. Count even at one and one. LSU came in with 118 home runs to their credit. That is uh, a sizable number, but well off their 188 they hit a year ago for a national record. And John Magnuson behind the plate calls that a strike one and two. Chris Reinecke showing the best pitch in baseball right now is a strike. Get ahead, strike one, and then you go strike two, and you have three pitches you can reach to for the out. The one-two in the dirt. Not bad pitch selection there. McClure's a guy who can drive the outside fastball out of the ballpark the other way, so we tried to set him up in that location, but tried to get him chase the curveball out of the zone. The 2-2, hammered into the left center. That could get to the wall. It's cut off at the track by Rusty Toms. His throw into second will be way too late. And Trey McClure now has his ninth double of the season. And he got a pitch upstairs, and Mr. McClure just nailed into the left center. That's exactly what happened. Bell tie down the middle, no doubt about it. 3-4-5, McClure, Furness, and Cressy, they will absolutely kill your mistake. So you have to be just as fine. It doesn't matter how good the curveball you threw before is. If you throw a bell tie down the middle, you're in trouble, and it doesn't get any easier now. Oh, and he's lucky that pitch stayed in the ballpark. McClure, with uh, 23 home runs, could have easily put that over the left field wall. But now the task, as you mentioned, Darren, is getting out Eddie Furness. At 399, 24 homers, 21 doubles, and a paltry 65 RBIs. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt when you have a guy like uh, Trey McClure in front of you, who hits 319. And Eddie's in such good shape, and he stayed that way all season, dropped some weight in the offseason. He's become a more athletic player, and he was a little disappointed in not being a top 10 round pick, and he's going to show him this year, and he has. Hold him on that one. That's the pitch to the power hitting left hander. You still have to be careful not to leave it out over the plate, but the changeup to the lefty is the key. He's going curveball changeup. Let's see if he wants to throw a fastball. Well, Furness against Ole Miss last weekend set the SEC record with 81 career doubles. Ranks first in the Southeastern Conference in home runs. 76. Palmero, Rafael Palmero held that record with 67. That's outside. Two and two with two down. 
He ranks first in LSU in home runs, RBIs, doubles, hits, total bases, walks, second in runs scored, third in at-bats, and tied for third in batting average. That's fouled right back at me. <laughs> Did you see me make that effort? Yeah, it's right over there next to you. I might get hurt. I've already been hurt. You <laughs> Darren playing in pain today. Minus a toe, or nearly. I'll have to save that for later <laughs> innings. Just leave it as a tease right now. <laughs> two down, the 2-2 two -two to Furnace. In the dirt. Well, if you're Ryan Akiti, you come back with a breaking pitch inside to Mr. Furnace. Well, I'll tell you, the best pitch he can throw here is a changeup. Try and get a changeup down in the zone. But Eddie's very selective. He's not a guy that will fish and chase in the dirt. But right here with the base open, I know Cressy's waiting on deck, but I throw him a 3-2 changeup instead of a fastball that could leave the yard. Ground ball to third. Chapman comes up, firing, throws a strike, gets Furnace, and Chris Reinecke gets out of the first inning. They leave McClure at second base. We will come back with the bottom of the first. The Bulldogs do up for the first time today. Do up for the first time today to face Doug Thompson, and here's how they will go at it offensively. Brian Weiss will play right field. He's hitting 430. The first guy to hit 400 at Mississippi State since Rafael Palmero. Rusty Thompson left field. Brad Freeman, your shortstop at 344. Richard Lee at first base hitting cleanup with 15 home runs. Brooks Bryan in center. Travis Chapman at third base hitting 344. Barry Patton's behind the plate. Dustin Dabbs is your designated hitter, getting some recent starts here. And Chris Lauterhaus is your second baseman. He hits nine at 3.30. The two-time defending national champions line up like this. Higgins, Harris, and Jeremy Witten around the outfield. Blair Barbier and Trey McClure have swapped in the infield. One, of course, was the second baseman in the third, and they flip-flop. Josh Dalton's the shortstop. Eddie Furness is at first base. Brad Cressy, the big slugger behind home plate, and the good curveball of Doug Thompson on the mound. The right-hander, no stranger to big games, of course. Thompson, 9-3. 92 innings of work this year, giving up 96 hits. A lot of strikeouts. There you see them. DRA of 4.3. Not bad numbers at this level. And, boy, that curveball is nasty. Thompson with a career mark of 21 and 6. And he's 5 and 2 in SEC play with 66 strikeouts. And his first pitch to Brian Weiss is called a ball. Weiss, impressive numbers. 430, 13 home runs, 52 RBIs. I really can't think that uh, there's much more you want out of your leadoff hitter. There's a fly ball in the right field. Jeremy Whitten makes the running one-handed catch. And Luis is out. And that is a tough out. Thompson a little bit different in Reineke. He will change speeds, but his curveball is such a hard curveball. He's not going to show you a changeup as much. Everything close to the same speed. The fastball mid-80s, a little bit higher, and the curveball close to 80 miles an hour as well. Rusty Toms, 3.15 on the year. Toms, not a lot of pop in his bat, but a good on-base performer. Pat McMahon in his first year as the head coach of Mississippi State took over for Ron Polk, who's now with USA Baseball. Ron Polk around Hoover Met past few days, and there's a ball that'll get in for a base hit. Sliced right down the right field line. Witten couldn't catch up with that one, and Mr. Toms is on with a single, our first hit, or second hit of the baseball game, the first for Mississippi State. Toms does the right thing, looks curveball and adjusts fastball. If you can do that all afternoon against Doug Thompson, you will be successful because he doesn't have the fastball that he can reach back and totally blow it by you, plus it's a straight fastball. Good piece of hitting. Brad Freeman, the shortstop. One of the big guns on this team at 344. Thompson throws back to first. This Mississippi State team not expected to show some pop at the plate, but uh, they have done so. Their second most home runs ever this year. There's a shot in the gap to left field. That didn't take very long for Brad Freeman to stroke it. He's on with a single, and there's two on with one down. 
Boy, if they come out aggressive, swing the bat, and they are sitting on the curveball of Doug Thompson. Look at the location of this pitch. Not bad, about knee high. He broke the curveball down there, but that's exactly what they're doing. They're looking curveball, adjusting fastball. We have some speed on the base pads now. Combined 30 stolen bases for these two men. There are your runners. Tom's at second, Freeman at first. And this is Richard Lee to face Doug Thompson. Fly ball into right. Witten will get his second out of the inning. And the bluff at second. The long throw right on the money at third base. So I think one thing was figured out is that Jeremy Witten's got an arm in right. What did he show? And they showed him a lot of respect, too. Rusty Toms took a bluff, but it wasn't much of a bluff. He took two steps, and he knew where the bullet was going. It was going right to third base. And good move there by Doug Thompson. He's not about to abandon the curveball. He knows he still can get hitters out with it. Thompson, one out away, of getting out of potential danger. Two on, two down. We're in the bottom of the first. And that's in there for a strike. These two teams met four times in the regular season, split those games. Mississippi State caught LSU earlier in the year at the Winn-Dixie Showdown and pulled off a victory there and then lost two of three during the regular season to LSU. Skip Bertman just 32 and 31 against Mississippi State in his career. I'd say this has been one of the teams that have uh, uh, given him the most trouble over the years. Great rivalries and uh, not to mention two of the best group of fans you will find anywhere at any sport. They love their baseball in Starkville and in Baton Rouge and uh, the folks are here today in good numbers. The box and Duty Noble. Are there any better places to watch a game? Fastball upstairs, and Brooks Bryan couldn't catch up with it. Well, now with the fastball in that location, he sets himself up to throw a curveball. See where this pitch is? It's about chest high out of the strike zone, but he sets himself up now to throw a curveball out of the same location if he wants to. Well, the one-two with two down and two on. Lined into right center. It's hanging up in the air. Will anybody catch it? No. It'll roll to the wall comes around to score. Here comes Freeman. And a triple for Brooks Bryan gives the Mississippi State Bulldogs an early 2 to nothing lead. Brooks Bryan just one for seven in this tournament to this point. It was the curveball, but he was sitting on it. Not a bad pitch down in the strike zone. He did. He threw it out of that same location. But Brooks was thinking right along with us upstairs. What a great piece of hitting. The key on that one, it's hard to keep your weight back on that big breaking curveball. Usually get out on that front foot, and it's a pop-up to center. Boy, Mississippi State draws first blood. That's good for them. The second triple of the year for Mr. Bryan. And Travis Chapman steps up. Another guy who's swinging a good stick. Nine home runs, 43 RBIs. Brian now with RBIs 36 and 37 on the year. in stairs inside upstairs and stairs in stairs it's it's a new it's a new way to call a pitch sure <laughs> that'll be out of play somebody will get a souvenir my man with a glove out in right field trying to catch the foul ball didn't even attempt to use his glove nope lost a shoe but gained a ball how could anybody walk around this ballpark without shoes on? Well, you'll explain that to us a little bit later, I'm sure. <laughs> There's a fly ball into right field. Jeremy Witten makes the out, and he makes all three outs this inning, but it wasn't before. A triple by Brooks Bryant. Scores two, and the Bulldogs take a two to nothing lead. Approximately 8.30 tonight. We are just getting started here today with a double dip. And, of course, uh, we'll be here the next couple of days. But Alabama and Florida after this game. First pitch to Cressy in there for a strike. Reineke gave up a double. 
for Trey McClure in the first, but struck out the first two guys and got Eddie Furness to ground a third, so no damage done. And now he has to get past Brad Cressy. He takes a look at strike number two. Cressy, Earnhardt, and Barbier. The third strikeout of the game for Chris Reinecke. And this time he gets Brad Cressy to sit down swinging. Great sequence of pitches. Fastball, fastball. Then climbed the ladder with the fastball instead of the off-speed pitch. Good idea to get it out of the zone because the last thing you want to do with Brad Cressy is make a mistake with his 22 home runs. Reineke is in a groove early. It is early, I know, but uh, certainly Reineke knows where his pitches are heading, and he's uh, got great location right now. Unless you're taking a lot of pitches early on as well. That one misses, but barely. Count even at one and one. Earnhardt on the year with seven home runs. 13 doubles to his credit. He alternates between designated hitter and catcher with Brad Cressy. Today he's in the DH rolls. That's fouled. Out of play. Once again, Reineke out in front. One and two the count. To Earnhardt. In game two of this tournament, an Arkansas loss. Eight to four. Arkansas knocked off LSU. Earnhardt did hit his seventh home run of the season. An opposite field job. That is strikeout number four. It's just that every pitch has a purpose, and he's hitting all of his spots. See where Patton's set up? And look where the pitch is. He barely has to move. Even the fastball before to Brad Cressy up in the zone where he wanted it. The curveball there out of the zone on the outside half. He, they're not getting comfortable in the box at all. RBA swings at the first pitch. One of the few guys we've seen <laughs> swing at a first pitch today. I was going to say, Barbier's always gone up there hacking. No doubt about it. And no reason not to. It's not like Reineke's not throwing strikes. Barbier's been a little disappointment at the plate, you could say, at 242 this year. I'm sure he would have liked to have those numbers up a little bit. And they will go up after that shot into center field. So Barbier with a two-out single will stop at first base. And the second hit of the game against Chris Reineke. And that's why the averages started to climb for Blair Barbier. Early on in the season, uh, he showed how much home run power he had last year, and he got a little home run happy early in the season. That's a good piece of hitting right there. Fastball out over the plate, one of the few, if only, mistakes by Reineke early in the game. Good look at Hoover Metropolitan Stadium, home of the Birmingham Barons. There's another shot into right field. First pitch swinging. Barbier will hold up at second, so back-to-back -back singles, and maybe these guys will well, start to swing at the first pitch. What happens when you swing the bat? The bottom line is with, with the aluminum bat, you can do a little more damage, and a pitch like that, too. That's down and in, and you can go the other way with the, with the wood bat. That's a, that's a shattered bat. But with the aluminum, you can be more aggressive and go after the first pitch, especially when this young Mr. Reineke is throwing a lot of strikes. Number nine hitter Jeremy Witten will step up. Hitting 310 on the year. Breaking pitch. In for a strike, 0 and 1. Jeremy Witten is a punter on the Tigers <laughs> football team. Actually, uh, before the spring game, or actually during the spring game in Baton Rouge, Jeremy trotted over from the baseball <laughs> park to the football stadium in his baseball That's uniform, right. got loose wearing the baseball uniform. Just threw the football helmet on. LSU should have a dandy football team this year. Can't wait for football. It's just around the corner, believe it or not. There's 
a little bleeder to the first baseman Richard Lee, an easy out. So LSU stranded one in the first. They strand two here. The Bulldogs lead after one and a half, two to nothing over LSU. Here at Mississippi State and LSU, part of our lovely crowd on hand. That was the largest crowd to ever see a college baseball game in this state. I think they get into this rivalry a little bit, huh? I would say so. <laughs> Great place for the SEC baseball tournament. Great hosts here at Hoover Metropolitan Stadium. And just a great facility all the way around. And Barry Patton steps in and takes a big cut at the first pitch from Doug Thompson. He's in the hole 0 1. Not such a big cut, but now he's in the hole 0 2. Thompson gave up a triple. That scored two in the first. And then throws three pitches right past Barry Patton. Breaking pitch, Patton never had a clue. No, and that's just what the order, the doctor ordered for Doug Thompson after getting lit up last inning. Comes out strong. And is that a great location for the curveball ahead 0 and 2? No way that he hits that pitch is all. You, as you mentioned, that's, that's what he wanted to do. He didn't want to give him anything hittable. And Dustin Dabbs at 222. Swings and misses at that pitch. Dustin, a guy that didn't play for nearly the entire season, but right. has stepped up of late. Has a handful of starts to his credit. John Knott, a freshman who was playing some first base and had some pop in his bat. His 13 home runs this year, but has struggled tremendously of late, so they decided to bring Dabs in. And Dabs takes a look at three quick pitches, and he will head right back to the dugout. So six pitches. And Doug Thompson has two strikeouts here in the second. And Doug's pulled himself back together. This pitch, Cressy wants outside, but it still catches the plate as he goes and gets it just a little bit. Right down the middle, actually, to Dabs. And no doubt about it for Thompson. He knows he's facing 7-8-9. That one's downstairs to Chris Lauterhaus. Lauterhaus is a guy that uh, kind of won the second base job in the last month of the season. He's played extremely well at second base, and he's swinging a pretty good stick as well at 330. Another strike. Nine pitches in this inning for Thompson. And seven have been for strikes. And look at Doug Thompson. He throws the ball, gets the baseball back, and gets ready to get right back on the rubber. He's taking a breather this time, but both these pitchers working very quick, not letting the hitters get comfortable. There's a high fly ball into right center. Cedric Harris weighs off Witten, and Harris makes the catch in a 1-2-3 inning. Doug Thompson might have found himself a groove. A couple of strikeouts, but the Tigers still trail by two. Mississippi State 2, LSU nothing. Both teams with three hits, and we go back to the top of the order for LSU and Danny Higgins, who was a strikeout victim his first time up to face Chris Reinecke. Fouled straight back off the plexiglass, off the net. Down to the field. That, there he is in the tournament. Two for five at a home run. Picked up his only RBI on that long ball. Fastball outside. Had some pop on it. Not a bad pitch right there. Off the off-speed pitch, he drilled the outer half of the plate and just outside of the black, I should say. Three and one to Higgins. Reineke a little miffed, getting behind 3-1 and one on Higgins. I'll be shocked if he walks him. The way he's thrown in this ballgame, he's challenged hitters so much. He did. Took a little something off of it, stayed outside, and Higgins is on with a walk. 
And that leads us to Josh Dalton, who will be followed by Trey McClure, then Eddie Furness. That's a situation, too. You get a 3-1 count. You've been pumping the fastball in there, getting your off-speed stuff over and the changeup. And then all of a sudden, you get in a 3-1 count. You tighten up a little bit. You aim the pitch, and that's what happens. Really nothing on it. Comes up to the plate like a dead fish. Dalton, also a strikeout victim, back in the first. Takes a look at a strike right down the heart. How hot has he been? 650 coming into the tournament. And then 0 for 7 in the tournament, so starting to cool off, but just ripping in the regular season. 0-2 on Dalton. You know, he's a guy, too, that probably put a lot of pressure on himself, filling the shoes of Brandon Larson, first-round draft pick, 40-home-run man who played shortstop last year for LSU, and now he's finally just starting to be Josh Dalton. Breaking pitch downstairs. Well, he started every game at short, which helps that you know you're going to be penciled in every time. And he transferred in from uh, the Big 8 Conference, Nebraska, and certainly the reputation of... Uh, the LSU baseball program is a great place to go play baseball, but having to fill some big shoes like that is a, a, a tough task for anybody, and it's got to wear on you after a while when uh, when the team is, as a team is, is hitting below 300, a team known for their power and their, and their pop in the bat, not hitting the ball very well this year, and I'm sure a lot of people were pointing at the shortstop position. I'm sure during the course of the year, and you know how people scrutinize baseball in LSU, but that has got to wear on you. Two people, actually, I think were affected. Blair Barbier as well. Those two were quite a tandem. And I think that Larson took any pressure off Barbier when he was a freshman. And Barbier delivered some big power numbers. So both those guys were affected by the loss of Brandon Larson. Foul back, two and two. Boy, was he something to watch. Remember had the home run he hit at Arkansas? Had some of the longest home runs I, I've seen. I, it, he was incredible. And if you go up to him and you, and you, and you talk to him and, and, and look at him, and he doesn't look like a guy that has that kind of pop. But my goodness, Brandon Larson knew how to handle the stick. Glad we had a chance to watch him play. If only for a year. Mm -hmm. Let's see if Skip wants to start the wheels rolling here. Danny Higgins, three of five stolen base. Let's see if he wants to have a little hit and run action. Runner going, strike out, safe at second. Dalton goes down on strikes for the second time in this game, but Higgins picks up his fourth stolen base of the year. Well, it wasn't a hit and run, either that or Josh Dalton missed the sign because he took a fastball right on the inner half of the plate, but a huge jump for Danny Higgins. Obviously, Chris Reinecke intently focused on the hitter and Josh Dalton really didn't pay much attention to Danny Higgins. Chalked that one up to stolen against the pitcher and knocked the catcher, Barry Patton. First out of the inning. And Trey McClure, who doubled to left center his first time. A little bit inside, one and one. <laughs> played umpire John Magnuson. Some umpires do it and some don't, but a lot of times he'll let you know by shaking his head no on a close pitch, and it almost looks like sometimes he's talking himself into it as well. That's in the dirt. Nice stop by Patton. So he didn't do it there. That one was in the dirt. But watch a borderline pitch where he calls it a ball and then emphatically backs it up by shaking his head no, just to make sure that we all know. Pitch was upstairs, took a cut at it, and fouled it right out of the ballpark. By the way, our souvenir that was over here, the foul ball that's in the box next to us, they came and got it. They took it. That is not right. That is not right. It was our ball. <laughs> Give it back. We're going to take our ball and go home. <laughs> in about six hours, we'll go <laughs> First of two today, right here on SEC TV. That pitch is in the dirt. Count goes to full at three and two. The second time in a row that Reineke has run a count three and two. 
Temperatures today hovering around 90. The clouds have come in a little bit, not expecting rain for the weekend. That is good news. Ground ball to third. Nice stab by Chapman. Comes up firing. It's high. Got him at first. Richard Lee got back on the bag and got McClure at first. A tremendous play at third by Chapman. Boy, these are the kind of plays you remember as saving a ball game if it's close late. Goes down to one knee after he makes a diving stab. Now watch this throw. Barely has time to set himself, but the key is at first place. Richard Lee, let's see if he got him. He did, back on the bag in time. Boy, what a great job by Richard Lee coming back down on the bag, doing the tap dancing, realizing where he was. Clure thought he had a, a base hit. Could have got picked up an RBI on that, but a great defensive play by Chapman at third. Keeps Higgins at second. And there's a strike to Eddie Furness. Furness grounded to third to end the first. Arguably one of the finest hitters in SEC history we're looking at right now. Back, you could say he was when you look at all the numbers. Ground ball to second. Lauterhaus playing short right field makes the play. And Furness is retired for the second time. Travis Chapman more than likely saved a run with a great defensive play. And don't forget that for the latest, most up-to-date information concerning the Southeastern Conference Baseball Tournament and other sports as well, tune in to secsports.com. The website has recorded over 16 million hits and 3.2 million page views during the first two days of this baseball tournament. And during the SEC tournament, the website is featuring a cybercast of each game, which has play-by-play -play audio, video, and statistical update features. And it's unbelievable the number of hits. As a matter of fact, Alabama and Kentucky yesterday received 4,046,675 hits. That is an all-time college sporting event cybercast record. So in other words, if you're not here at the game, if you're not watching on TV, you can get everything you want from the net. You're not net boy because there already is a net boy. I think you're net guy. I love my internet. There's a shot. Brian Weiss pops one into left center. That'll bounce off the wall, and he'll head to second. A man hitting 429 will boost his average somewhat as he strides into second base with his 20th double of the year. Well, here we are at the top of the order again, and they gave Doug Thompson fits early on, and they sat curveball and were expecting it. Weiss was out in his last at bat, but he was right on the curveball. This time, he's looking for it again. The key there was the location, though. That started just above the belt and ended up about just above the knees, and he sat right on it. That one was up in the zone. Rusty Toms takes a look at a ball inside. Loser of this game is eliminated. The winner will go on to play Arkansas tomorrow at... 10 a.m. Central Time, 11 Eastern. And, of course, we'll have that for you right here on SEC TV. And that catches the inside part of the plate. One and one. It looked like the same pitch we saw moments ago. It did look like the same pitch, but Tom's, of course, unhappy about it. Maybe he shouldn't be too unhappy. Maybe it could be 0-2. The 1-1. That's upstairs. Thompson staying inside on Toms. Toms not about to back off that plate. Trying to keep him from sitting on the curveball and diving out over the plate. That's what you do when you bust guys inside. Pickoff play at second. Dalton tried to sneak behind Weiss. And this game, besides the SEC tournament, is so important for Mississippi State. They really need to continue to win here and try and play themselves into a regional because right now they consider themselves on the bubble. Bressy took that one. It looked like maybe he got that one off the thigh. But he will hobble around and shake that paint off. You see the hockey-style mask that both Earnhardt and Cressy use at LSU. Gives the chin, the neck area, a lot of protection. You see a lot of catchers in big leagues trying to head in that direction. I would imagine, though, that that takes some getting used to after uh, the conventional mask that we've seen for a number of years. There's a shot into right field, Darren, exactly what you were talking about. 
And we saw a look at Witten's arm moments ago, so Weiss will just hold up at third base, and wisely so. But runners at the corners, and there is nobody down here in the Mississippi State half of the third. Well, he knew he couldn't keep on throwing fastballs inside, missing for balls. He was sitting on a fastball out over the plate. It's the same old thing. You look curveball and adjust fastball and drive it the other way. He did it in his first at bat. He's done it again, and he has Doug Thompson figured out. Thompson has shown the changeup to a left-handed batter, but he needs to start throwing a few changeups to righties. And here comes Brad Freeman, who singled back in the first, came around to score on Brooks Bryan's triple. I think a cool 500 in the tournament. Stayed upstairs, 1-0. There's Weiss at third. And there is Toms at first. And there is nobody down. The Bulldogs already ahead, 2 to nothing. Five hits in the game for Mississippi State. McMahon knows what's at stake. He's been, been open to discussion about this upcoming NCAA tournament. There's a high fly ball in the left field. Higgins going back. He's at the track. That's out of here. A three-run shot by Brad Freeman gives Mississippi State a 5 to nothing lead over LSU. Freeman just got his hands extended, and boy, was he ever looking for that pitch. Has he had an incredible tournament? And Thompson is rattled as he hits Richard Lee in the shoulder. Breaking pitch had no break in it. He talked about it. Sorry about that, Doug. Just shaking up right there and he didn't hit him on purpose as some might think you mentioned I, I believe that was either a change of or a curveball he just was frustrated tried to throw the heck out of it here comes Brooks Bryan who tripled this time he tries to lay it down foul ball actually got a piece of it take another look at this home run Oh boy, <laughs> yeah, oh boy, is a good way to describe it. Bell tied down the middle, and when you're looking for a curveball and you get that one, that's almost like a dream come true. Five runs on six hits, and we're not out of the third yet. Nobody down here in the third against Doug Thompson. That's in there for a strike. Don't go thinking this ball game's over, folks, though, with LSU's firepower and their ability to hit the ball out of the ballpark, especially late in the game. You know Pat McMahon knows it's far from over. That is a perfect pitch. Outside part of the plate, and Brooks Bryan will head back to the dugout. Thompson just battled his way back and gets the strikeout. Well, it shows you a little something, too, about Doug Thompson. We see some action down in the LSU bullpen. Jake Estevez, who has started and relieved for this club after taking last year off, transferred back into the LSU program. He can do a little bit of it all, as can most of the guys. Skip Berman trains his pitchers that way. But a good sign by Doug after hitting the batter, after giving up the three-run homer. Looks like he pulled himself back together against Bryant. Throw back to first. Nothing happening over there. Because he's a young man that pitches with so much emotion. That's kind of his guide. And it's hard at times to keep it in check. High and low. See Lee at first with his lead. Thompson steps off the mound. There is Travis Chapman. See what he's done this tournament. Chapman made a tremendous play in the top of the third inning at third. Yeah, 
has to stay within himself. He overthrew that pitch right there, just like the changeup two batters ago that hit Lee. He has the stuff. He still has the stuff to get these guys out consistently. There's a shot into right field. Witten played it perfectly. And Lee will have to head back to first. So two down in the inning. <laughs> and that leads us to Barry Patton. And you know, Doug Thompson's a guy that's been in the big, big games before. He won the game against Alabama at the College World Series a year ago. A spectacular season. It was an honorable mention. All-American. So uh, being in pressure situations like this where the loser of this one heads home and right. uh, this is a situation where Doug Thompson uh, has been before. Well, as you mentioned, pitching in the biggest situation where the loser heads home, final game of the College World Series, you don't get any bigger than that. Was called upon last year and did a wonderful job. Thompson actually out of high school selected LSU over Mississippi State. Tulane also in that mix. But Skip Burton was able to land him and he's been a, uh, an effective guy for him as he's gone 21 and 6 in his career at LSU. 1 and 2 to Patton, and 2 down. Here comes the one two yeah. Pat strikes out for the second time in the game Thompson rattles back rallies back to strike out two but he gave up a three run long ball and the Bulldogs lead it by five. Certainly be a hotly contested tournament simply because so many good teams get here. Mississippi State had to really battle. Arkansas had to battle to get here. Kentucky's a team that uh, uh, did wonders down the last month of the season to make it in here as the eighth seed. But here's how it transpired on day one. Mississippi State beat South Carolina 9-8. to eight. Arkansas over LSU 8-4. to four. Then Thursday, LSU had to come back, and they blanked the big sticks of South Carolina 6 to nothing. And who would have thought that South Carolina would have been out of here after two games? They came in as a hot baseball team. Arkansas then beat Mississippi State, which since the Bulldogs into this baseball game, Arkansas hitting about 440 as a team in this tournament. In our other bracket, Auburn beats Alabama in a game that had over 14,000 here on hand. Kentucky loses to Florida. Florida had to rally to come back and beat Kentucky 6-4. to four. And then on Thursday, Alabama beat Kentucky. That sent the Wildcats home, but congratulations to Keith Madison and company for their performance just to get here was certainly something to cherish. As a matter of fact, he even brought his team by the Hoover Metropolitan Stadium before the season was out and said guys this is where we want to be and about that point they brought them uh, they picked it up a little bit and uh, got here to the tournament and then Auburn beat Florida last night six to four sending Florida to the losers bracket so Auburn and Arkansas are taking the day off and they will play tomorrow and there is Pat McMahon who got his team uh, to rally uh, the rally call was sent out in Starkville and his team has responded you see his number here in uh, numbers here in the first season 36 and 19 and with that I will send it to my partner Darren Sutton will take you through the next three innings of baseball, and hopefully they'll be as exciting as the first three, Darren. Be glad to, partner. Brad Cressy, Clint Earnhardt, and Blair Barbier. Five to nothing, Mississippi State. And this is a team, as we talked about in the open, that no one really wants to play. The seventh seed in the tournament, they fought their way in. Last couple of weekends, they had to win. Finished out the season 8-3 and three in the SEC. After a 6-12 and 12 start at one point, they even went 1-2 on a weekend series against Kentucky. I talked to Pat McMahon, and I asked him, my first impression was that maybe that was a wake-up call. You think you're going to go into Kentucky and win big, uh, but, but you go in there at the time that the Cats are turning it around. That one right through there, 3-1 and one the count. That wasn't the case at all. He said that we ran into a Kentucky club that was playing like a buzzsaw at the time. He said the key was we actually didn't let that get us down. It wasn't we were overconfident, but it just seemed to wake us up right about the time after that where we realized we could do great things. Brad Cressy on five pitches draws a walk. But both those teams were down at the time, and I think Mississippi State was hoping that they could fatten up that weekend on the Cats, but the Cats were just about to crank up their machine. But then they go 8-3, and three, Mississippi State does, to finish out the year. And all he was talking about when I talked to Coach McMahon was character. 
He said this club has so much character and they work so well together. Clint Earnhardt takes ball one. And you see the tournament numbers. Clint hit that home run back in game two. It was an eight to four loss to Arkansas. But the crowds have been great. Just looking down at the different times. That game two, there was close to 4,000 people at the game. We mentioned the Auburn-Alabama game, 14,390. And those two went head to head the other night. And a good crowd as well tonight on hand, as you see. That one's driven well to right center field, but it, it's going to stay shy of the track. Brooks Bryan runs it down. Throw back to first base, but Brad Cressy didn't go too far. Well, Cressy's quite a story. Grew up around Major League Baseball. His father, Mark Cressy, caught in the Dodgers bullpen for years and years and then was elevated to bullpen coach. Actually had a chance to, to speak with Mark just a few weeks ago at Turner Field, and he said he watches SEC TV all the time. He has his satellite dish out in California. Tunes it in, of course, so the Dodgers are LSU fans, if that makes sense. Blair Barbier. Two for eight in the tournament with a couple of RBIs. That one misses downstairs, one and one the count. Partner, how's that new pencil working out for you? Got that pencil last week in Gainesville, and it has been nothing but stellar. Now you see the things that it's like, Dave. Pops that one foul and out of play. I'm a simple man. No comment. Guys in the truck think they're funny today. <laughs> they do. They think they're funny. Went after a fastball, and that's popped high and out of play. It's going to be off the score box. Well, let's share what they said. They wanted to know if it was a pencil or a crayon. <laughs> and I guess my next thought was, can you color in the lines? No, I can't. Well, I look at your book. You're staying in the lines. Yeah, my book has certainly improved. You know, I, I'm like a guy that just gets rolling through the year. The first game, a little shaky, and uh, I went back and looked at it. And it was hard to read some of the lines. One, two is driven. Well to right center field. Will the ballpark hold it? against the wall. Blair Barbier sitting on the off-speed pitch, and Brian Weiss, how far did he go to run that one down? Take another look outside part of the plate. Brian Weiss gets on his horse and never had to leave his feet, runs right into the sign. That is a tremendous play at full speed, and Brooks Bryan... All he could do was acknowledge the fine play by his partner in the outfield. It's one of those where you just tip your cap. And you were beat by a better man in that case. Drops down a bunt. Let's see if he can beat it out. Reinecke. Field throws. That's why they have pitchers fielding practice, folks. What a great job off the mound by Chris Reinecke. How about a little defense in this inning? One walk. He was left stranded. Mississippi State up five to nothing. Come on, there you go. <laughs> See if they're online with it. They got it. <laughs> you know, you'd be doing this if you didn't have an injured toe, right? <laughs> you know I would be. <laughs> you got to love Which baseball. one is young Dave Neal here? How about this one right here with the jean shorts on the far left? That's the, you. The one with no rhythm. That'll be me. There's me leaning over the rail about to fall off. <laughs> <laughs> what are the chances of him keeping hold of those peanuts? <laughs> That's good. Let's not crawl, climb up on there. <laughs> Five to nothing, Mississippi State. We're having a ball here. <laughs> we talked about the huge crowds. Everybody's having fun. It's college baseball at its best. And with seven ranked teams, a regional's going to be hard-pressed to put fourth baseball this good. It won't happen. <laughs> You're right. It just won't happen. Dustin Dabbs, Chris Lauterhaus, and Brian Weiss. Five to nothing. Mississippi State so far sending a big message that they're fighting for their lives. We talked about you don't want to back LSU into a corner. Well, Mississippi State kind of 
back into a quarter themselves even before this ball game started playing themselves for their regional lives. 0-2 though. Doug Thompson surrendered the three run home run last inning. Gave up a two run triple in the first. Late on the fastball. Will it stay in play? Just foul. Congratulations, section 205. There you see it right there. Dabbs has seen a changeup from Thompson, but he's looking for the off-speed pitch as well. That's why he took that fastball just about out of Brad Kretzky's catcher's mitt. Thompson had a big start against Vanderbilt earlier in the year. Picked up a win. On April the 10th, he struck out 12 Commodores. Good curveball. And isn't it amazing when you can look for a pitch and still not hit it? Just take another look at uh, what Thompson can bring to the table. And as you mentioned, he is certainly a prospect that guys will keep an eye on. And that is one of the reasons why. When you can get something that nasty to break that sharply. That one misses outside to Chris Lauderhaus. Yeah, there's definitely uh, no short supply of scouts and baseball executives. Jim Beatty, the general manager of the Montreal Expos, was here last night. That one's lying to center field. It gets in front of Cedric Harris. Harris tried to pull the decoy real quick, but that one bounced well in front of him. So Hedrick, Harris with a good try. But the number nine hitter, Lauterhaus, has a single. Cedric really did all he could with that one. And Chris, a little bit of a threat on the base pads. We'll talk about that in a moment. Take another look at it. Harris, with great speed, actually broke backwards toward the wall. That might have cost him an out right there. Made a nice, valiant effort. And that's the kind of play that can get by you if you're not too careful. But he kept it in front of him. And just a routine single. Brian Weiss doubled and scored back in the third. Flew out in the first. Huge cut. Jim Beatty, the uh, general manager of the Expos, is here, and I learned something today about him. What did you learn? Well, not only does he, with the Expos, of course, and their small payroll, try and get a great bargain out of a player, in other words, somebody who can be an all-star for a few years at a, at a good price. Just a sec. Yeah. Another huge cut. But I also learned that uh, he tries to get a good bargain out of his clothing. He's a discount shopper. He's a discount it? shopper. We were in the same discount clothing store, of course, Brand X clothing store. We don't right. give names on TV. There's a change. <laughs> <laughs> the 0-2. Downstairs, but the runner is advancing in Lauterhaus to throw down, not in time. Darren, that's just heads-up baseball. That's kind of the reason why Mississippi State has been successful of late. They've been taking chances, and it's been paying off. Lauterhouse, on top of his game, realized the ball was going to be a few feet away and took off. No second thoughts about this at all. Cressy keeps it in front of him, but Lauterhouse just said, I'm gone, and he beats the throw. And now there's a runner in scoring position with one down. And the top of the order. That's why you put somebody down at the bottom of the order who is a headsy player, somebody with at least decent speed or above average, because it's almost like a second leadoff man. That's a great point. The 2-2. Two -two. Got it. Just went up the ladder with the fastball, and it looked so good to Weiss. He couldn't lay off. Six strikeouts, and we're in the fourth inning. Just a high heat. And that was way high. Weiss would uh, love to have that mm -hmm. cut back. That's one of those pitches that looks so good, but what, what can you do with it if you hit it? There's no way you can drive that pitch. It's just too high up in the zone. Rusty Toms, singled and scored twice. Rips that one back up the middle. Waterhouse is on his horse. The throw is cut off. Nobody at first base so easily goes back to first and Toms. He's three for three. And partner heads up base running gets Mississippi State a run. It's six to nothing. Rusty Toms didn't waste any time. The breaking pitch hung out across the middle of the plate. He hit a rope out to center, and Witten comes up firing. But because Lauterhaus was able to get to second base, he just kept on moving. Throw was cut off by Furnace. And Skip Bertman is going to make the change now, as Doug Thompson has seen it all. And I think Skip's a little upset with Doug, and I, I think Doug's probably a little upset with himself. 
absolutely. Jake Estevez is going to get the ball call from the bullpen, I should say, and then he'll get the ball when he comes in, of course. Abso I'm sure he's upset with himself. He's trying to get in tip-top shape, and with a 6 to nothing score, Mississippi State leading. We have a new pitcher. We'll tell you all about him when we come back. The defending national champs have their backs against the wall in an elimination game here at the SEC Championship. Mississippi State up six to nothing, and Jake Estevez is a new pitcher. And Mr. Estevez will take the mound with his 4.95 ERA. He's nine and two on the year. A nice record. He's made 23 appearances, started 11 games, has one complete game to his credit. Against, LS, against Arkansas, he went 3.2 innings, gave up eight hits, six runs, all earned through 73 pitches. But Jake Estevez has uh, certainly thrown his fair share of innings this year, 91, and he has 86 strikeouts to 32 walks. Fighting back, and we're really just starting, folks, here at the Hoover Met in Birmingham with the SEC Championship. Of course, coming up next, Alabama and Florida. It's the next ball game following a short break. Then tomorrow, there you see it, Arkansas is waiting on the winner of this ball game. Then our next game, Bama, Florida. They take on Auburn, 11 a.m. and 1.30 p.m. Eastern. All sorts of baseball here at the Hoover Met. And then, of course, the championship game on Sunday. The Fighting Tigers are fighting back. They score three in the last half inning, and now Jake Estevez, the man on the mound, has a more important job than anyone. He needs to keep Mississippi State right where they're at. He came in last inning and faced Brad Freeman and walked him and got out of the inning. It's a beautiful shot you see right there at the Met. Coming in from center field. Coming in from somewhere out there where Eddie Furnace's ball came to rest, somewhere in the, the woods, in the forest out there. Good fastball, but it misses away to Brooks Bryan. Brooks Bryan, Travis Chapman, and Barry Patton. Five, six, and seven for the Bulldogs. Bryan triple back in the first inning. Put this club back on top, or on top, I should say, for the first time, two to nothing. Two for nine on the tournament is Brooks Bryan, but oh boy, Cressy took another one. That's the second time he's taken a foul ball off the thigh, and that one really hurt. So many years he watched his father get beat up in that Dodger bullpen, warming up some of the greatest and not some of the greatest pitchers, and he's taking a beating here himself tonight. One more look. Just a it looks like it caught him right on top of that knee pad. Made him game a little uh, stinger, as they say, right across the kneecap. And that shows, <laughs> that shows you why they wear the protective gear or the tools of ignorance, as they call them. As that kneecap exposed, the foul ball off that one, that shatters it every time. He shakes it off the big man, the big power hitter, and what a what a player he's turned out to be for this program. He has professional catcher written all over him. So one and two the count. Mississippi State would like to answer back. That one just misses outside, two and two. You see Cressy behind home plate, he looks in. Skip Burtman calls all the pitches. Looks like he wants the fastball. He thought about it. He thought about calling it a strike. John Magnuson behind home plate. And you see Cressy taking a look, but keep an eye on Blue behind the plate. Woo, gave it that right shoulder turn. Uh, uh, three, two, and he popped that one. That's coming our way. I didn't see that. My goodness, it wasn't higher. That almost hit me in the foot. Makes in a glance. Could have hit me in the in foot. The I would have had a hurt foot, and you would have had a hurt foot. <laughs> the 3 2. Ball four, he lost it. Not what the doctor ordered for LSU after putting a three spot on the board to walk the leadoff hitter. You heard some boo birds coming out, those directed at uh, home plate umpire John Magnuson after that. Uh, <laughs> 
Well, I guess you could say he faked us on that one. Was going for the call third, but held off and sent the runner down to first. Skip keeping his composure in there, though. Still calling the pitches and not with any lip out there. None that we saw, anyway. That has to be frustrating, though. Because if anybody goes to battle for his pitchers, it's Skip Bertman. Well, you know, I think he feels comfortable right now. Confident and comfortable. Six to three. They're back in the ball game. And uh, as we saw, all it takes is one of these long balls from LSU. And this game could turn around in a hurry. Brooks Bryan, the runner at first base. Six of seven in the stolen base department. Chapman has hit the ball well both times. Flew out to right a couple of times. Has gone the other way. When he was facing Doug Thompson, he was another hitter that was looking curveball, adjusting fastball. Snap throw over to first. <coughs> Chapman hitting 475 the last 10 games. Slugging percentage up around 700. As a matter of fact, Chapman hasn't struck out in his last 11 games. Pitch out. Nothing doing. Interesting call there. there. There is right there. You talked about it, a sign that Skip Bertman knows he's back in this ball game. All of a sudden, it was 6 to nothing. now 6-3. He's pitching out, keeping an eye on the runner. See the man sitting next to Skip Bertman, Randy Kiesel, has been absolutely dominating this season for the Tigers on the mound. Left-handed pitcher. He's another pro prospect. That one misses outside and away. Picked up a complete game win yesterday. Keesler did, I should say. Yeah, Keesler has been uh, one of the reasons this team has been so successful. An ERA under four in this conference. He's eight and five in the strikeouts. 126. Among the nation's leaders in strikeouts per nine innings. Two and two the count on Travis Chapman. Chapman can put the ball in play pretty well. Let's see if they roll the dice on the hit and run here. Nothing doing, but he hits it like a hit and run. A chip shot to right field, base hit. And on to third with great base running goes Brooks Bryant. Boy, did he turn on the afterburners. May as well have been a hit and run because it ended up exactly the same. Well, just stuck his bat out. That ball was about eight inches off the dirt, and about three feet away. If that's not uh, an aluminum bat base hit, I don't know. But it was obvious that Brooks Bryan was headed for third base, despite the fact that Jeremy Whitten's got a gun. They were willing to challenge him. You mentioned it's so much respect for the arm, but just as Skip Bertman knows his team is back in the game, so on the other side is Pat McMahon, and every run counts. We've seen the ball leave the ballpark tonight. All of us SEC fans know what can happen at the swing of the bat. That one catches the inside corner, down and into Barry Patton. And Barry would like to get it going tonight. He's 0 for 2, a couple of strikeouts. Now 3 for 9 in the tournament with a couple of RBIs. The Bulldogs catcher loads that back leg. Late on the fastball there. 0-2 the count. We know about the Jake Esteve slider with an 0-2 count. Wouldn't be surprised if he broke it out. Because with the runner on third base in Brooks Bryan, the strikeout would be just what the doctor ordered. This is a situation where a double play really isn't good enough. Trailing 6-3, you want a strikeout. You don't want that run to come in. Pressy scoots outside. Fastball, and he was late on it. And Looking for the slider as well. Was Barry Patton. LSU defensively up the middle, not all the way back to double play depth, in a few steps. There's a look at the Tigers on the infield. Still would turn it if they could, though, but would love to throw the runner out at the plate. There's the slider, and he got him. What a big strikeout. And the third time in this ball game that Barry Patton has gone down on strikes. Dustin Dabbs. You called it a slider, and we see one of the reasons Estevez is so dangerous. And Barry Patton is just having a nightmare at the plate. Three consecutive strikeouts. Mm. And he knows it. Harder. 
So much emotion at this level in these games. These guys put their heart and soul out on the field for their teammates, like no other sport at, at any other level. Alwa misses upstairs, still runners on first and third, but then still just one out. Now a double play will be just fine. Dustin Dabbs, he's also struck out twice. So the seven and eight spots for Pat McMahon have been a hole tonight. A left-handed batter. Takes on the inside corner. One and one the count. Not happy with that call. That's just a tough pitch right there. Pat McMahon trying to hold on to a three-run lead in the bottom of the fifth inning and add to it. Late on the fastball. That one is out of play. Talked about John Knott, the designated hitter for most of the season, the freshman who Dabs has replaced. Such a power surprise has been John Knott. 13 home runs this year, but the strikeout total, 44 and 158 at-bats. Otherwise, we'd be seeing John Knott again tonight. But he's a young man, SEC baseball fans, that you will hear from a lot in years to come. I think the length of the season probably got to him. One, two, just missed. Jake Estevez wanted that one. Woo, there you see him turn around and take that deep breath. The runner on third base is Brooks Bryant. Travis Chapman is the runner on first. I think you're exactly right. There's no way that any high school players used to playing 55 ball games against this kind of pitching. Late on the fastball and just really was just staying alive as he fights that one out of play. Two and two the count. I mean, think about it. We're looking at two guys from LSU, Thompson, who's out of the ball game right now, and Estevez. Two guys that can, you know, are going to be draft picks to major league. Le will have a good chance to get to the major league Absolutely. level. Absolutely. And uh, where, where else are you going to find that? I and mean, he was having to face that week in and week out. That one's thrilled. Slide as Cedric Harris he makes the catch, and because of that, no problem coming home is Brooks Bryan. Seven to three, Mississippi State. And a really good at bat for Dustin Dabbs as well, as he fell behind in the count and just battled back with a huge RBI. You know, Mississippi State got a break on that because Cedric Harris out in center field had to leave his feet which took out a complete play at the plate with the runner tagging up as you take a look as Mississippi State picks up their seventh run of the game and every run matters at this point. The number nine hitter Chris Lauterhaus singled and scored back in the fourth inning flew out to center in the second. He's four for eight on the tournament three for eight I should say with a couple of runs scored and an RBI. One and one the count. That one catches the outside corner. Yeah, Harris is, uh, he's having a hard time getting the read on, ba on the baseball tonight. It's a couple of times he stopped dead in his tracks, either that or backed up before recovering. He can make up with it with his speed. He wasn't able to earlier. Good pitch, one and two the count. Well, at night, this is a very difficult ballpark. I was out in right field last night during the late game and Auburn in Florida and it is a tough tough task if you're an outfielder to pick up the ball because the fog kind of settles into this area. Chop to the left side. Dalton goes the easy way for the out. One run and one hit for Mississippi State. They're holding on to a four run lead on the national champs. Four over the LSU Tigers and Chris Reinecke has decided to well, I don't know if he decided, but somebody decided for him that that would be enough as he leaves with a four-run advantage, and that leads us to Brian Compton, who will step in in his place here in the top of the sixth inning. As you see the numbers on Mr. Compton, he has got some dazzling numbers, a perfect record on the year at 4-0 with an ERA that is minuscule at 1.36. He's made 19 appearances all out of the bullpen and he has struck out 60 to just 14 walks. So a guy who's got some serious control. He's only given up one home run on the year and opponents hitting 198. Well, you can see Pat McMahon's logic right now. And he's greeted. Clint Earnhardt drills it to center, but at the track, Brooks Bryan makes the catch. 
You can definitely see the logic. Brian Compton for two, possibly three, and then Van Johnson. This is a huge game, no doubt about it. He goes to his pen, and he's going to go to all of his firepower as soon as he can. He pitched an inning versus South Carolina in the tournament in the first game. Gave up three hits, one earned run, struck out one. Gave up two doubles. Good, tight, off-speed pitch on the outer half. One and one the count to Blair Barbier, who's one for two. Singleton was left stranded back in the second. A couple of hits in that inning, and LSU couldn't capitalize. Chased it. Compton has faced LSU twice this year. Pitched four innings, giving up three hits, one walk, and he struck out four. One with the fastball outside there with the one and two count. You see Barry Patton look long and hard to get the sign, and he wants the old number two curveball. Sky to the left side. Three Bulldogs converge, and none can make the catch. RBA just barely got a piece of the aluminum on that one. He opened up with a big swing. There's a souvenir. Big cut, but that ball was uh, downstairs, and you got to really be flexible to turn like he did on that. And to even keep your hands back because his whole front side had totally opened up. He was trying to crush that baseball. Two and two the count. Compton looks long and hard. Another off-speed pitch, and it looks like right now Barbier's sitting on that pitch. Let's keep an eye on the sign behind home plate and see what Barry Patton calls. Good indication of the quick hand speed Barbier possesses. That ball was probably already across the plate before he even cocked his wrist, but still got a piece of it. Fastball in, no, looks like he wants to curve ball again. Just missed outside. Good location, but now it's three and two. Three and two with one out. Seven runs, nine hits, no errors for Mississippi State. LSU trails it with three runs, five hits, and no errors. He wants another curve ball. Left it up out over the plate. What a swing there by Barbie. <laughs> Surprised he didn't tear his jersey open on that one. No doubt about it, this young man does not get cheated at home plate. We mentioned last year up the middle. Quite a home run combination with he and Brandon Larson. When Barbier was just a freshman, the 3-2. Fastball got it. And Barbier doesn't like it a single bit. Curveball after curveball after curveball. And here you go. Hit this fastball on the black. Another look at it. Had a little tail on it. Might have come back and crossed the outside part of the plate. A little bit low. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. Pitcher's pitch. Barbier may have a beef about that call. Pitcher's pitch. Well, a lot of times, too, is that one catches the inside corner to Cedric Harris. It's not only the frustration at the call, it's the frustration that if I knew it was going to be called a strike, I at least would have taken a hack at it. But I really, I didn't know that that was suddenly a strike. Payback time a little bit on there. That one misses upstairs, one and one. But overall, John Magnuson. He's a good pitcher strike zone tonight, but he's very been very consistent. Swings through it. Well, he, Compton, we see why. And the number is so dominating. We see why the 60 strikeouts in 46 innings, uh, the mixture of pitches and the tight late break on that curveball. And here it comes again. He went around. Absolutely. Brian Compton just comes in and dominates. One, two, three, go the LSU Fighting Tigers. It's the Bulldogs by four in Birmingham.
Aaron Sutton, along with Dave Neal, Mississippi State, with a four-run lead in, in the elimination game. The loser of this game goes home. The winner moves on in this outstanding championship tournament. And remember to keep up with the entire tournament from top to bottom, from game to game. Make sure and check out www.secsports.com. I'll keep you up with every single game. They actually have cybercasts of each game, and it has been busy to say the least. This man right here, a four-run deficit, wants to keep it right there as he relays the signs to his catcher, Brad Cressy. And in turn, Jake Estevez, the man on the mound, gets the signs. Jake gave up a run back in the fifth. Wants to hold them right where they're at. Chop to the left side, just foul. And we're back at the top of the order and Brian Weiss. Weiss doubled and scored a run in the third. He's also struck out and flown out. Oh boy, there's a souvenir. Can I please, please, can I, can I? Come on, give it. Here. Ugh. Oh one. Way up and in. Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, back at the temptation. Oh, he's sending him deep. Oh, that's it. Start a fight. Look at the catch, though. <laughs> some, for some reason, we went back to the game. <laughs> One and two the count. I don't know why we did that. There's the winner. Some of our most memorable moments have been watching spectators <laughs> Try to corral the foul ball. <laughs> the one-two. Laid on the fastball, popped it out of play, and that's another souvenir in the stands this time. No such fight going on there. Yeah, still, boys will be boys. It doesn't matter how old they are. You get your hand on a baseball, there's no way he's letting that one go. Fastball misses up and away, two and two the count. LSU down by four. Bottom of the sixth inning. Game nine at the SEC Championship Tournament. And that's chopped to the left side. Barbier, couple of pumps, throws in the dirt. Great scoop by Eddie Furness. The senior leader at first base does it with the stick and now does it with the glove. And you want to know why this guy is an all-SEC performer, an all-American? This is part of the reason. We talk about his stick, but he has got great hands at first base and makes the picture-perfect scoop in the first out of the inning. Eddie Furness, not only a great baseball player, but a great person as well. I was just going to say the package deal. He, he nice young man he worked so hard in the offseason was disappointed in his draft location outside of the first 10 rounds and he worked his tail off in the winter dropped 20 25 pounds more athletic he's a guy now at the next level could be able to play in the outfield if he's not a medical uh, student That's exactly and a doctor right. <laughs> outstanding student as well part of the SEC baseball academic honor roll. Eddie with a 3.466 grade point average. Backed him off the plate. Did that one have some giddy up on it or what? Is that one of those in stairs type pitches? That one was definitely <laughs> in stairs. Tell us why it's in stairs, Dave. Because it's a little bit up. Well, actually around bell. I wouldn't call that in stairs, but in stairs is. That's in and upstairs, right? That's a combination. I like to create a new word every game. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> what do you remember? How much, when you host a regional, that it increases your chances of going to the World Series tri-fold. <laughs> tri-fold. That's a good one. That was that last, last week's week. work. <laughs> two and two. He fights off the fastball <laughs> and pops it foul and out of play. <laughs> tri-fold. Yeah, well. It yeah, doesn't make it your chances two times as good, but actually tri-fold. <laughs> Well, let me just say this. If I'm not going to make up new words, who will? <laughs> Give me a chance to, though. The 2-2 two -two on the outside corner. What a pitch. Backwards game, the book, and really, Rusty Tom's not a bit of argument. Hustles back to the dugout. It's amazing that you can go from Duck Thompson to Jake Estevez like this. I mean, these two pitchers we have seen today have great stuff. I know Thompson was... 
cut out of here after giving up six runs. But Jake Estevez, he has got all the same tools that Doug Thompson has and is oh so impressive with his fastball. That one misses downstairs to Brad Freeman. Two run homer back in the third, walked in the fourth, singled and scored in the first. In other words, folks, he's been hot. Six for 11 in the tournament with four RBIs. Drives that one off to the right side. Talking about the SEC baseball academic honor roll, really what it's all about for these two teams. 15 combined on the field, five for LSU. Justin Sanders, Blair Barbier, Matt Colvin, Chris Dumui, Eddie Furness, and Doug Thompson, and 10 members of the Mississippi State team on that honor roll squad. That one misses downstairs. Brooks Bryan, Scott Clark, Mark Freed, Jeremy Jackson, Van Johnson, Richard Lee, Brett Muleman, Sparky Sparkman, Rusty Toms, and Brian Weiss. And Jeremy Jackson, a perfect 4.0 in microbiology, the senior left-handed pitcher. And Jeremy Jackson was the Board McWhorter Scholar Athlete of the Year in the Southeastern Conference, the Male Scholar Athlete of the Year, another guy that certainly has uh, been effective on the mound and in the classroom. And he's another one of these class acts. I mean, Absolutely. there are so many of them in this conference, it's unbelievable. And the guy at the plate right now, certainly a guy that knows what he's doing academically and athletically, a 21-game hitting streak to start the season. Pop foul and out of play and a good at bat. He's fouled off several pitches and trying to find the one he likes. But that's so neat to see. Two of the finer teams in the nation and of course in this conference and you put them together on the field and you have 15 members of the SEC Baseball Academic Honor Roll. The 2-2. Hung around long enough but didn't get a pitch to drive. Sky to the right side. For the third out in the inning. One, two, three. Go the Mississippi State Bulldogs. Can this bench and that team rally? It's seven to three Bulldogs. As we head to the top of the seventh inning, LSU looking to do some damage. And really, you and I have talked about it, Dave. It's you host a regional, you increase your chances trifold of going to the World Series. But seriously, that's real honor for this. It is a real honor for this conference to have two members of this conference hosting a regional. Well, four teams made it to the College World Series a year ago. They'll be trying to do the same thing again this year. And with LSU hosting a regional and Florida hosting a regional, those are two big reasons why I think that you'll see those two schools, Florida, your 1998 SEC regular season champions, and of course, the history of LSU baseball speaks for itself, back-to-back -back national championships for the decade of the 90s. And there are the other regionals, Miami, Florida State. So three schools in the state of Florida will host regionals. The one regional I'm a little unsure about is Clemson. They have struggled of late. They lose two games and out at the ACC baseball tournament, but yet they were awarded a regional, and Wichita State and Stanford rounded out. Now the big question becomes, how many teams from the Southeastern Conference will make it to the NCAA tournament? There's been talk of six, five, and seven possibly, and there's one of the teams that we know will be there, Absolutely. the Alabama Crimson Tide, getting ready to take on Florida in a matter of moments, but uh, it's a tough task. I'm a firm believer in numbers don't mean anything. If you deserve to be there, if you've played your tail off all season long, you've won 40 baseball games and you've done the right things, you should be there. I don't care how many teams you take from a conference, it's not fair. I totally agree, and I think competition speaks volumes. If you win 40 games and you win a bunch of games in the Southeastern Conference, the finest conference in the nation for baseball, no doubt about it, seven ranked teams, there's, there's no argument. Some may argue, but you have seven ranked teams, there's really no argument, the argument ends. And uh, if they take seven and they're all ranked, I, I don't think there'll be anybody disappointed that gets to see those seven teams play at the at their respective regionals. We'll take us home, partner. Dave Neal with the rest of the play-by-play -play action. Thank you very much, Jeremy Witten, to lead things off for LSU, trailing by four as we move to the seventh inning. Brian Compton, the junior college transfer from Hines Community College. On in relief of Chris Reinecke, who went five innings, gave up five hits, three runs, and looked pretty impressive. Got into one bit of trouble and gave up a long ball to Mr. Eddie Furness, but he's not the only guy to have done that over the career of Eddie Furness. He has 77, I believe, career home runs. 77. Let's check that, though. I always am a stickler <laughs> for the numbers. You know me. Yes, sir. 77 career home runs. Of course, the SEC's best all time. Well, Witten, the number nine hitter. Then we're back to the top of the order. And he goes down on strikes. 
They check it first. And Tony Manners says, yes, sir, you went around, and we'll call that a strikeout. The fielder, Danny Higgins. Boy, Brian Compton has brought some amazing stuff to the mound. Two strikeouts last inning and a 1-2-3 inning. Look at this pitch. Unbelievable. The bottom just falls out in the key, as we talked about. That curveball breaks so late. That goes all the way back. Barry Patton in a unique position. Barry, I tell you what, Barry and Brad Cressy today are having their work cut out. When game time started today, the temperatures were up above 90. There's a ground ball, hit to second. Lauderhouse comes up throwing. Higgins goes down, that's two outs in the inning. And that is five straight, now retired by Mr. Compton. And when it is that warm, one of the key things to do is to wear a blazer. Shortstop, Josh Dolan. With a tie. <laughs> and a blue shirt. And no shoes. <laughs> How much blood have you lost today, by the way? Come on. No violence in this show. It's a family show. Had the paramedics visit us right before we went on the air today. I guess we better tell about that. That was pretty good stuff. Darren stubbed his toe and all kinds of problems arose. And there's a base hit from Josh Dalton. <laughs> Gets his first hit of the game after striking out his first two times up and walking his last appearance. Well, I had the new Second shoes, base. and you know how new Three shoes do. They wear the back of your heel out. So I said, I'll just walk around in my socks in this knee press box that we're sitting in. And only problem is I, I caught a little nail sticking out of the ground right around the corner where the normal seats sit, because we're actually out in front of a luxury box, and caught the nail in between uh, both of my toes and so I said I, ha I need a band-aid to the truck and they sent three members of emergency up here. Yeah, how many times do people say, hey, watch out for the... No, they all said it. I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm not saying. And they're actually like bolts that hold the seats. They're not nails. And folks, I got to deal with this every weekend. <laughs> So anyway, I'm surprised Ponch and John didn't show up from Chips as well. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, and I'm serious, three members of the paramedic team showed up here. I think there was a little miscommunication that I was just looking for a Band-Aid. Well, when you started crying, I knew something was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> one and one is the count. There's two down, and we are. I started crying when I put my blazer on. <laughs> Runner at first, two down. Here we go. Trey McClure is one for three today. Taking a look at the Compton pitch in the dirt. Patton thought about going to first, but held off on it. And don't kid yourselves, folks. It's medical terminology like we bring you that just separates us from the other announcers around the nation. Every weekend. There's something, isn't there? We bring it to another level. Which level, we're not sure. That's upstairs, three and one, Compton behind to Trey McClure. Now he's in dangerous water right now with two outs. He needs to go ahead and put this hitter away with Furness and Cressy waiting. Yeah, you don't want two on with Furness stepping up. And you don't want one on with Trey McClure stepping up. Straight away center field off the monster speaker, a two run home run. The second home run of the game for the LSU Tigers. That increases their team total to 120 on the year. And we've got ourselves a two-run ball game. Brian Compton has shown the outstanding curveball, but you fall behind, and if you don't have the fastball to back it up with these bats and the bat speed of this LSU lineup, it will bite you. Look at the location. That's belt high down the middle. Trey McClure saw that pitch in batting practice all season long. Look where this pitch lands. Unbelievable. As you mentioned, off the monster speaker in straight away center field. That leads us to Furnace. And here's what Furnace did his last time up. Another ball that was hit like a bullet off the arm of Chris Reineke. And that sailed over the right center field wall. That might have hit the speaker, speaker had it been a little bit more towards straightaway center. And there's a foul ball out of play. It just goes to show you, and you talked about it back in the third inning, 
when it was a five to nothing Mississippi State lead. No lead is safe with LSU. Their batting averages has been below 300 for the last month. They're hitting right. below 250 in this tournament, but with the ability to get one guy on or two guys on, they can score them in one swing. That's exactly right. Timely hitting is their key, and it's going to be their key in the postseason as they continue to play on. Hard hit, just foul past the first base bag. You know, you can talk about it all you want. Okay, 250 in the tournament, lowest average in the conference. But how many teams going into LSU to play in a regional think that that really helps their chances? They won't even acknowledge that number, I don't think. Absolutely not. No, no head coach at any level would especially when they hit the home runs late in the ball game that they have all season long. Breaking pitch downstairs. That was a good eye right there by Eddie Furness, too. That's something he's grown into more and more as he's grown in this conference. Such a selective hitter. And he has the walks to prove it as well. stayed up around the letters, but he had some velocity on that. That's a tough pitch to lay off. I was just going to say that is probably the best example right there. He just knew he couldn't drive it because it started on the inner half. He wouldn't have gotten the bat through the zone quick enough, and he just took it. By the way, that was only the second home run Compton's given up all year in 48 innings of work. And Mr. Cressy will walk. Or excuse me, Mr. Furness will walk, and that is not the first time he's done that this year. And that leads us to Brad Cressy, who's 0 for 2, which is not where Brian Compton wanted to be, that's for sure, with two outs. Remember now, all of this has happened with two outs. The strikeout of Witten, and then Higgins grounded out to start things, and the single by Dalton, the home run by McClure on a 3-1 count, now the walk to Furnace. Now Brad Cressy has a chance to tie this thing. And you got to think he's due after going 0 for 2. He checked into the game at a 318 clip. He's got 22 home runs and 72 RBIs on the year. Nice pitch on the inside part of the plate. It's a two-run baseball game. Five runs on seven hits for the Tigers, seven runs on nine hits for the Bulldogs. We are in the top of the seventh inning in game one. We'll bring you game two right after this one. Alabama and Florida will do battle. That's upstairs, and it's a rematch of the 96 SEC Tournament Championship game when the Gators and the Tide do battle. Eddie Furness, the 62nd time he has walked this season, an on-base percentage about 550. Brad Cressy can hit the ball out of any ballpark at any time, and he will kill your mistakes. Fooled him on that one. Nice pitch from Compton. Well, that's where he needs to keep it to the sophomore because no doubt he pulled his head out a little bit and was going for the downs. He has to stay in and try and drive that ball to the right side. Got him. They check down to Mr. Manners at first base again, and he calls him out. Brad Cressy with a check swing strikeout. But a long ball makes it a two-run game. We are back at Hoover Metropolitan Stadium just outside of the Birmingham city limits in Alabama. As LSU and Mississippi State do battle, we head to the bottom of the seventh inning, seven to five Bulldogs on top. And don't forget, Approximately a half hour following this game, it'll be Alabama and Florida between games. Uh, a special look of beyond the game when we sit down and have a conversation with the commissioner of the Southeastern Conference, Roy Kramer, in a pretty candid conversation. Uh, he's very open about ideas concerning expansion, the bowl system, the conference in general, where we're headed. And uh, it's certainly an interesting conversation. Hopefully you'll stick around for that, and then we'll come back and have first pitch between the Crimson Tide and the Florida Gators. Chris Tamui comes on for the LSU Fighting Tigers out of the pen. He's had some work already in game two of the tournament. Tamui worked an inning and two thirds as we look at his numbers on the season. Gave up three hits and allowed two runs. 65 innings of work. He can rack up the strikeouts. We see that. And a tough left-handed customer in Chris Tamui, and that's why right there. That is an indication 
of what Chris Demui brings to the plate, and that is great off-speed stuff. That off-speed pitch in the dirt. Richard Lee 0 for 2 today. In 509 innings of work for the LSU pitching staff, they have 564 strikeouts to just 203 walks. That's in the dirt. Skip Burtman calling this pitch at 2-1, which is on the way to Mr. Lee. Grounded to short. Dalton comes up firing to Eddie Furness, one down. I think a big out for Chris Demui. Hey, falling behind two and one, you don't want to walk the first guy in the inning. Now he's got a little confidence, probably got a little sweat coming out now and can kind of just settle in. I think we might, uh, unless something drastic can't, uh, changes, I think Demui will be here the rest of the way. He's a very durable pitcher, has been. He started for Skip Bourbon. He started in conference games. He's come out of the pen. As we mentioned, all of his pitchers are, are very, very versatile, and he likes it that way, and that's why they've been so successful in the postseason. You know, turn and look at a starter and ask him to come out of the pen, and he's scared. They, they're used to doing it all. Breaking pitches have been consistently in the dirt. And he'd rather miss there than up in the zone. We've seen the balls fly out of here tonight on hanging breaking balls. That's a strike, one and two. And that's a nasty pitch right there. Just about unhittable. Good tight leg break on it. Struck him out, his first strike out of the game for Chris Demui, and two outs in the inning. Well, you see what it sets up. You throw the off-speed pitch, and then you run the fastball by. They've mentioned such good breaking stuff. Makes the fastball at about 84, 85, look closer to 90, and you can just sneak it by, folks. Travis Chapman looks at that breaking pitch. Fastball downstairs. That might have hit him, and it did. Came inside twice. The second time, he popped Chapman right in the foot. Let's go. May hit the ground and then the foot first. Let's take another look. See if it, no, it had him right on top of the shoe. That has to hurt a little bit. Right above the arch. You see the reaction in his face. That well, you, you, know about that, that one. you know about that kind of pain on the foot. <laughs> I mean, if anybody's going to talk about that had to hurt, you can. <laughs> Breaking pitch across the belt. Maybe this they can send the whole Hoover City ambulance crew out there. <laughs> like they did up here to the press box. who has struck out three consecutive times still looks to be very unstable at the plate. Doesn't seem to have his balance, swinging at bad pitches, and I think his confidence was shot from the first at bat here today. Throw back to first. Furness had to make a nice play. Cressy showed a little bit of his arm strength. Patton came into this game hitting 364 over the last 10 games, and it's just uh, one of those days, I guess, when you just don't feel right at the plate. One and two, two down, runner at first, two run, Bulldog lead. Here's a strikeout. Cressy will come up firing to first, and that'll do it. So two strikeouts in the inning for Demuri, and Barry Patton continues his offer with four strikeouts. But the Bulldogs still lead it by two, and the... Bulldogs by two, seven to five, top of the eighth inning, and well, at least our second game opponent showed up. You know, it's one of the great things about conference tournaments at any level. All of us who played the game can remember the atmosphere of either playing your game and when you're over showering, putting your team jacket back on, going out to the stadium, and when you get out a little early, watching the other team play, a team you may face down the road, and it's neat for the fans, too, to see the teams that are getting ready to take the field sitting in this beautiful ballpark and Florida's up next partner against Alabama that's gonna be a great 
should be a dandy. Florida, your, your SEC champions of the 1998 regular season. They win by a half a game over LSU. And as a matter of fact, they were rained out in a third game of a three-game yep. set against Alabama. That was the half a game difference. And all year, they were trailing LSU by a half a game. And it turns out that that half a game worked in their favor. And they uh, pick up the SEC championship over LSU by a half a game. Great race this year in the SEC as Clint Earnhardt steps in looking for his first hit. And he also looked at a strike there. 0-1 to start the eighth inning. You talked about it at the end of the half inning. The LSU emotion is starting to reach a fevered pitch. They know what time of the ball game it is. Well, Tony Manners isn't going to call everybody out on strikes every time they go down to him. That time he said no. Going with the four umpire system here at the SEC tournament. John Magnuson behind the plate. Manners at first. Tony Thompson at second. And Ken Couch at third. Well, there's no denying that that was a strike right down the heart. Last night, home plate umpire Tony West in the late game got. Uh, in one of the, in the evening session, a strikeout. Compton continues to be impressive in terms of the strikeout as he gets out number one here in the eighth inning, and that is a big out, and that is the fifth strikeout recorded by Compton. Downstairs. Just a great curveball, and that's been his out pitch, and it, nothing really that Earncar could do to lay off of that one. Blair Barbier is one for three. But Tony West, an umpire behind the plate in the evening session game last night, just came up lame after a pitch. And it turns out that he kind of tore his calf muscle and took him to the hospital, checked him out, and uh, will be sore, but should be all right. And there's a high fly ball into left field. Tom's on the track, just shy of the wall, makes the catch. Barbier just missed getting that out of the park. That ball hung up in the air, and it thought it was never going to come down, and I'm sure Tom didn't either, as he just kind of strolled back to about two feet shy of the wall. And boy, didn't it get quiet in here as many Mississippi State fans held their breath big time as he went back and back, and then he reached the track, and everybody was holding their breath on both sides. That leads us to Cedric Harris, so none, nothing... Uh, a rye there if you're a Mississippi State fan. That's just a loud out number two. Once he caught it, the hearts were stopping right. before that. Right. Breaking pitch just misses count even at one and one. Harris on the day one for three, singled back in the second. It's grounded out and struck out. There's a ground ball to short. Freeman comes up firing. And that'll do it. That's a quick one, two, three inning. And now the Bulldog fans are up. They sense their team has a chance for an upset. It's Mississippi State 7, LSU 5. SEC baseball tournament from Hoover Metropolitan Stadium in Hoover, Alabama, just outside of Birmingham. And Birmingham, of course, the home of the Southeastern Conference offices. Mississippi State leads it by two as we move to the bottom of the eighth inning and Pat McMahon in the glass is right there. He's been happy with the way his team has performed thus far. The loser of this game heads home. The winner of this game moves on to face Arkansas tomorrow morning. And here comes John Knott, the freshman with 13 home runs. Will pinch hit for Dustin Daps. 42 RBIs, but you see the average, which was up around the high 200s about a month ago. That's the kind of slump he's been in of late. And Demui, in relief of Estevez, who relieved Thompson, who started the game and gave up a quick five runs after three innings. Demui still pitching not with a great deal of respect, though. He knows what this young man can do. You make a mistake. He has incredible power. That's a strike. That's a tough breaking pitch. And that is a strikeout. So John Knott continues to struggle at the plate, but Damui continues to pitch well on the mound. That is his third consecutive strikeout. 
unhittable. That breaking pitch starts on the outer half and breaks down and in, especially to the young man. And look at Chris Damui, such a compact delivery. Turns and goes home. Fastball. Waterhouse way behind. Holds the glove up out in front of his face. Looks a little bit like Tom Glavin. And that's a key for you youngsters who are pitchers and folks at home that want to do it. You keep the mechanics simple. Small step back, turn, and drive to the plate. Downstairs. Probably the only difference in the two is that Dumui just has a slight arch of his back before he drives home. That one's in the dirt. And that actually hit Lauterhouse right on the foot. A lot of foot problems today. Earlier, Dumui hit another Mississippi State player right on top of the foot. You see, same spot. One for four. Honor House looks like that's still stinging just a bit. off first. Ryan Weiss looking for a second hit. Fouls that straight back. Nine hits in the game for the Bulldogs and seven for the Tigers. This is the fifth meeting of the year between these two teams. They have split two games. Mississippi State needs every win they can get at this point. In terms of an NCAA bid. That's upstairs. Count even now at two and two. Arkansas in the same position, but they have looked uh, oh so impressive in this tournament so far hitting up around 450 as a team through the first two games they along with Auburn have the day off today they will play tomorrow waiting the winners of our games today winner of this will face Arkansas and then Auburn will play the winner of Alabama and Florida and if it's Alabama you can imagine that there will be another sizable crowd here Another record-setting crowd here. That's fouled straight back. They had over 14,000 in day one when Auburn and Alabama squared off. And this place holds about 16,000. You can pack them in here. Great baseball park. Not a bad seat in the house. Very fan-friendly. Well, with an Auburn and Alabama playing, looks like when there was one basketball player playing in this ballpark. Of course, Michael Jordan. Remember the Birmingham Barons in his day? I was actually broadcasting in that league for the Jacksonville Suns that year, and that was all everyone talked about. When is Michael Jordan coming to town? In every ballpark, some ballparks, they put people on the warning track and rope off so that the field of play would end at the warning track and have folks standing all in the outfield so they could watch Michael Jordan play baseball. Well, the only other crowd that surpassed the Al Alabama Auburn crowd was a crowd to watch Michael Jordan make his debut here with the Birmingham Barons. That's inside. That'll go to full at three and two. Lauterhouse still over at first base. Oh. 
Ground ball. Hit in the gap. Great piece of hitting for Brian Weiss. Lauterhouse on his way to third, and you wonder why this guy hits 430. Well, he saw Josh Dalton make a break for second, and the hole was open. You cannot execute a hit and run any better than that. A lot of times on the right side, the second baseman will cover, but now on this time was a shortstop. He knew where his hole was, and he hit it right where it belonged. That is so key, and if they put another run on the scoreboard because of that, we'll look back on that and see it as such a key point in the game. It's the little things that win ball games, especially for teams like Mississippi State. That was so sweet. Picture perfect baseball right there. And when Pat McMahon talks about character and effort, those are the kind of things he talks about. Hitters getting the sign and doing what it takes to execute, knowing that they can't sit back on the three-run home. The movie going inside again. Loves to throw that breaking pitch inside to right-handed hitters. He's hit two guys today. He hit Chapman in the seventh and hit Lauterhouse, who now stands at third base. Both with breaking pitches right on top of the foot. Lined right at second. Double play, LSU's out of the inning. Just when the Bulldogs thought they had something going, a hard hit ball to Trey McClure, who doubles up. Brian Weiss at first base. Hit right on the button, but it results in a double play. That could be the player of the year in college baseball. He will take to the mound in a matter of moments, but we have business at hand, and that is the ninth inning LSU down by two to Mississippi State. The winner will play Arkansas tomorrow right here on SEC TV. And Jeremy Witten will lead things off, the number nine hitter for this Tiger team as Compton continues to work in release of Chris, relief of Chris Reinecke, who worked five strong innings for the Bulldogs today. Change up in there for a strike. And Matt Peoples is your new second baseman replacing Chris Lauterhaus. What a nice game today. Peoples in for defensive purposes, a change that Pat McMahon makes just about every game when his team has a lead. strikeouts for Compton today and the Bulldogs know how important a win like this would be in the eyes of the committee. There's a fly ball behind second base. Peoples waving off Weiss and he makes the catch. One down in the ninth. You seeing, uh, sensing what could be a, a bad way to go into the NCAA tournament. That is, lose four or five games. But we're at the top of the order. That is a strike. 0 and 2 on Higgins. The 0-2 on the way, in the dirt. Higgins struck out to start the game back in the first. And has walked twice and grounded out. down to their last out. That's in 
in there for a strike. In the dirt, one and one. Dalton has struck out twice today. That catches the outside part of the plate. Compton in front of Dalton. Check swing, he held back. Count even at two and two. Just missed. Josh Dalton just didn't want to swing the bat, it looks like. He's looked at five pitches. Trying to get on base. If he can reach, it'll be McClure, then Furnace, then Cressy. McClure and Furnace have already gone deep, but you don't have to worry about it. Brian Compton with six strikeouts in relief of Chris Reinecke, who also struck out a half a dozen. And Mississippi State pulls off a big, big win over LSU. The final, 7-5. And the winner, Chris Reinecke, the save goes to Compton. And LSU bows out of the SEC tournament. But they will go home, regroup, and get ready for an NCAA regional and try to make it three consecutive NCAA championships. But the task at hand for Mississippi State is we're playing tomorrow against Arkansas at 11 a.m. Eastern right here on SEC TV. A fantastic pitching performance by Reinecke and Compton, who combined for 12 strikeouts. And it was Compton getting Josh Dalton on a 3-2 pitch to end this game. He went with the breaking pitch. They caught the outside part of the plate, and John Magnuson called him out, and you can bet these guys are happy because this might be the win that gets him to postseason play at the NCAA tournament. And right now, Darren Sutton, who is headed down to the field, is with a jubilant Pat McMahon of Mississippi State. Guys? Thank you very much, Dave and Coach Pat McMahon. An unbelievable win. You and I were talking before the game, pretty much off the record, and you talked about this team's character. Boy, did they show it tonight. Well, you know, it's a, a great group of young men and turned some things around. We're very, very proud of their effort tonight. Some timely hitting, some timely pitching. LSU is an outstanding ball club in, uh, in every facet. They're so well coached and play so hard. So we're very, very proud of the win today. And uh, but we got some business to take care of and uh, we'll try to get better tomorrow. Let's expand on that pitching against a team that hits the ball out of the ballpark with regularity and especially in big games. Reineke and Compton, you have to be so proud of those gentlemen. Well, we really are. You know, we tried to get Chris to start her to get 15 to 18 outs and then give the ball to Brian who pitched well against them down at LSU and he did another outstanding job. We honestly were going to make a move with Van Johnson in the ninth, but he had a little pull under his rib cage. I hope he's going to be okay, but we're happy the way Brian finished the ball game for our ball club. And the timely hitting, how much did it mean to you guys to get that emotion on your side early on? You know how well LSU plays with that emotion. You guys were able to grab it early on. Well, yeah, I think that's a big key for our ball club. Anytime you can jump out and put some numbers on the board, it's critical because what happens is the other team has to play catch up. And we know well that LSU with one swing of the bat will put numbers up very, very quickly. So it's a key for our ball club. And Brad Freeman's home run, I think, was just very, very clutch. How much does this mean when, how much does this win mean, I should say, to the regional committee, quite honestly, as they look at your team's chances? You said, you know, we should be in possibly anyway right now, but you keep winning, you're going to force their hand. Well, you know, our, our goal and mission was to beat LSU today. They're fine. We know we've got to get ready for Arkansas tomorrow, who's an outstanding ball club. We hope we're very much in consideration, but that's in the clinic committee's hands, very honestly. Congratulations, Coach. Thanks so much. Coach Pat McMahon, Mississippi State knocks off LSU and eliminates the Fighting Tigers from the tournament. Dave, back upstairs to you.
Nice job, Darren, and congratulations to Pat McMahon, one of the good guys. Sorry to see the LSU Tigers head home and their big sticks, but folks, we will hear about them in the coming weeks as the NCAA tournament is just around the corner. But the Bulldogs win a big one by two over the Tigers. Back with more in a moment. Compton and our starter, Chris Reinecke. Mississippi State wins it 7-5. to five. And don't forget, we've got Beyond the Game, which will be followed by Alabama and Florida. Beyond the Game, a special look at the Commissioner Roy Kramer. We sat down with him, had an extensive conversation, and we'll be back, of course, with Alabama and Florida. And tomorrow, another double dip coming your way. And we know what game one will be. That'll be Arkansas and Mississippi State. And then... At 2.30 Eastern, the winner of this particular game that's coming up, Alabama and Florida, will face Auburn at 2.30 Eastern right here on SEC TV. And, of course, Sunday will be the championship game, and you can tune into the same channels to watch that as well. Well, Darren Sutton standing by with a guy who came out and kind of set the tone for the Bulldogs today. His name is Chris Reinecke, and he gets the win. Guys? Did he ever, and this young man was absolutely dealing tonight. He came in 4-6 and six looking for your fifth win, really trying to stabilize your yourself and, and we talked about it your changeup was so key you had a nasty one tonight yeah it, it helped me out a lot on the batters uh, when I left it up I got hurt but it helped me more than it hurt me so that was good for us well we talked about this LSU team we were talking to coach McMahon about them they're a team that later in the game and in key situations you get them down you got some runs to work with early they'll get you every time they have the timely hitting did you have that in the back of your mind all the time every pitch out there I have to make a good pitch every time well with the LSU team like they're hitting that you know you got to make a good pitch every time but the run support that we got early I mean you feel comfortable pitching with run, runs behind you so but I knew I had to make timely pitches and good pitches each time out well you sat in the dugout and watched the last few innings and watched your teammate Brian Compton bring this one home let me ask you this what was going through your mind and in your heart was it racing back and forth oh it was, I mean <laughs> I don't know how to explain it but I was just sitting there hoping and praying and it, it helped it helped us and Compton did a great job and so we got a victory in your quiet times away from the ballpark when we're all not around watching you do you guys talk about how much wins in this tournament mean in other words for you guys to get a chance to play at the next level in the regionals you know you had to make a good showing here that's the thought of on all our minds we know we got to we had to beat LSU and we got to come out tomorrow and beat Arkansas probably two games so we're just going to come out and do our best tomorrow coach Pat McMahon talked about the character of this team you guys struggled early in the season six and twelve at one point and then battled back eight and three to finish up in conference play really turned around after a struggling weekend against Kentucky what what, what is the makeup of this team why does this team have so much character why is it such a special year for you guys we uh we all pull together we all like each other I mean we all get along real good um and we knew that coming in that, I mean we had to, our hitting came in through our pitching came through all at the same time in our defense so that helped us out a lot all right thank you very much partner great win congratulations his fifth win of the season let's send it back upstairs to my partner Dave Neal well, number five couldn't have come at a better time as he goes to five and six on the year. Threw a nice job. Gave up three runs through five innings. Bulldogs pound out ten hits. No errors. A well-played defensive game. Just a solid college baseball game. I'm glad you could watch it right here on SEC TV. We'll come back, have more from the Met in a moment. Mr. Reineke and one of our offensive stars of the game happens to be a fellow by the name of Rusty Toms who had three consecutive singles through four innings and finished the game three for five. Three of the ten Mississippi State hits on the afternoon, and he is standing by right now with Darren Sutton. Guys? Thank you very much, partner. An interesting thing right here. I'm standing with Rusty, and he's holding his hotel room key in his hand, which means that they get to stay for another night with a big win. How key was it for you guys? hanging out, wanting to stay in this tournament, and really wanting to show at the next level that you guys belong in a regional. Well, it, it's very key, and uh, it was very important to us tonight to come out and get on, get into a fast start tonight, and uh, that's what Arkansas did to us last night, and uh, it took us out of the game a little bit, and we were fortunate enough to get some runs early, and uh, Chris and Brian did a great job on the mound keeping that lead. This hadn't been your tournament thus far. One for nine coming in, but three hits tonight, an RBI, and a run scored. You stepped up for your team. Yeah, well, I, I've, uh, I hadn't been hitting the ball as well as I'd like to, and uh, you know, fortunately, I saw some pitches I could hang on tonight, and, you know, I didn't hit the ball as hard as I'd like to, but they found some holes, and that's all that mattered, and it, it was it was good. It's kind of the question of the night about this Mississippi State team. You're the third person I've asked it to, but why is this team so different? The character on this team, your coach was talking about it, Pat McMahon, but there's something special about this team. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with we're a senior laden ball, ball club, and we've been here for some of us four or five years, and uh, and that means a lot because we play together a lot, we hang around each other a lot, and uh, we're, we're a close-knit group, and uh, 
you know, we're playing for our lives right now. Like you said, we don't know if we're in a regional. So every game we go out thinking it's our last and it very well could be. So I think that keeps us together. You were standing on the base when Brad Freeman left the yard. How did that feel in your heart when you saw that ball fly out? Well, that's a great feeling. You know, Brad, Brad's a tremendous hitter, and uh, it's a big ballpark here, so I wasn't for sure if it was going out of the park. But he hit it. He hit it good, and I think he knew it when he hit it. But, uh, you know, that's a great feeling seeing him come through like that. Here's a look at that home run. And I tell you, I know you were standing out there, and your heart just jumped right out of your throat with excitement, and I know the bench was coming through. Let me ask you about being on the bench and in between innings, watching your guys hitting and standing in the outfield. As that LSU team chipped away and chipped away, and you guys have seen it. We've all seen what they can do. In the back of your mind, you had to be thinking, keep it down in the strike zone, guys, and your pitchers did a great job. They did a fantastic job. You know, LSU's in, so, uh, such an explosive team, and, they, and like they proved with Furnace and McClure's home run, they can score a lot of runs very quick, and <laughs> And fortunately, we, we added to the to the lead a little bit, but not as much as we'd like to. But at the same time, Brad, I mean Brad, Chris and uh, Brian did a great job holding that lead, and the credit goes to them. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Back up to Dave. I'm giving the room key back, by the way. Well, that's <laughs> good news anyway. <laughs> Don't forget that coming up, it's Beyond the Game, and we'll be back in a half hour with Alabama and Florida. Beyond the Game, a special edition.